Hey guys, welcome to part three of the mix down process. So I'm mixing a track from Enzo Bennett. Uh, if you haven't seen part one and two, check them out first. Uh, we've covered a few things like EQ. Uh, we'll do a little bit more of that in a moment. Um, we've done a bit using Transient Master. So in this video, I'm gonna be touching on a bit more EQ when and where to use it and how to use it. Um, I'm gonna be covering some compression. Um, I'll be covering maybe a touch of reverb here and there, just where it fits in a mix. Um, and that's basically gonna be it for this, I think. The Like I say, the, the, the track itself is solid anyway. Um, and I think that makes a, a mix down as much as it's more of a pleasure to do it's also more tricky because you want to just improve that which which takes us then to the final stage of the mix which is all about listening to everything together and getting that sort of balance right ready for your master stage um if i have time in this one or maybe the next session if it if it overruns um, I'll actually go through a bit of that master stage as well. Uh, probably better as a, a separate video, but whatever. Um, so yeah, let's get on with it. So in the last session, um, I think the last thing I did was adding some uh, EQ touches to one of the hi-hat loops. I was talking about getting rid of that sort of low-end inner high-end sound in a, in a high frequency sound I should say um, I the last place I left this was at 900 Hertz um, I'll just go back to that again and let's find out where it is over there so this sound we basically just scooped a bit out of that if I bypass it um, so I don't know how you're listening to this on whether it's headphones or decent monitors or whatever, but for me, there's a huge difference there in this room. Um, I can hear loads of low end in that. Um, so by scooping out the first 900 hertz of that loop, it's just really crisped it up. I might even take that a bit higher, to be honest. Yeah, so with that, I've taken it to 1.1K. I think we can probably raise it a little bit in the mix as well. I'm in narrow view at the moment. Um, there we go. All right, let's have a look. So with this... Yeah, so actually when that's playing, I can probably raise it a couple of dB. Let's give that a go. Yeah, so I've raised that almost 5 dB, look. Um, it's still only sort of peaking at, what was that, minus something? There we go, minus 17 dB. So, you know, it's still... It's still not particularly high in the mix, and I've already raised it 5 dB. And part of the reason for that is because we've taken some of the energy out from the low frequency, and that's given us a lot more room to lift the levels and make it brighter and crisper. And that's kind of the point with EQ. So on that note, when you're dealing with EQ in a mix down, I always recommend, and I mean generally, I recommend this for, for all situations all the time, um, always use subtractive EQ and never additive EQ unless you absolutely have to. Just as a general rule, I'm sure there's gonna be exceptions to that. I'm sure some people are gonna comment disagreeing and that's absolutely fine, but, but my rule is subtractive EQ. And by that, I mean, take bits away from the EQ. So for example, these hi-hats, what we've done is we've taken out the low end and that's given us room to turn the gain up a bit, which has made them seem brighter. 
So a lot of people I've noticed will raise the high frequency of a hat because they want it to sound cleaner, brighter, sharper, whatever. Um, but if you think about that, if I'd have just raised the high end, I'm not actually freeing up any space. I'm, I'm increasing the energy level in that, in that high frequency area that we wanted to do. That's fine. That would have achieved that part. But the knock on effect of that would have been that we're not actually freeing up any room in the low frequencies, which can start to make things sound cluttered. So as a general rule, I always say to people, subtractive EQ, don't bother with additive. You might want to do that in a production stage for whatever or, or some kind of effect, or you might find you're using a particular noise that, that has a really wide range of frequencies in there and harmonics. And if that's the case, then obviously you might want to go with additive just to lift a particular harmonic or frequency range of that sound. But it's just so rare that you, you you need to do that um it's so rare that you have an instrument that's such a wide range of, of frequency so it's not really something i'm sort of too fussed about the other thing then is just quickly we'll um move on to i've i've written a couple of comments here and again this is one of the reasons why i like pro tools for uh mix downs and and stuff is because you've got these little comment boxes down here and that's really handy um because you can see I've put EQ question mark. So um, I'm gonna have a listen to that. Where are we? Over here, for example. There we go, so exactly the same rules apply. In fact, so much the same rules, I'm just gonna copy and paste that over. So we've got the exact same instance there. I'll bypass and I'll give it a quick listen and see what it sounds like. That's actually making no difference. So I've also done it over here. So don't bother with that. And what have we got over here? Okay, well I can hear there's some low end in that one. So that's a kind of shaker hat type thing going on there. Um, so I'll take the bypass off. Oh, and that's much better, instantly better. So um, yeah, so we'll just leave that there. There's an, I, I'm not even gonna bother playing around with the scoop because you you get the picture um, and that's probably it in terms of EQ I can't really hear anything else that's bothering me um, although there might be a couple of bits here and there that might want a tweak later on um, the next thing to focus on for me is compression now <clears throat> I actually in my own tracks rarely use a compressor um, and in fact I know a couple of other producers in fact one of uh my good friends uh james who goes under the name funk case works in the 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 dubstep is a huge name in the dubstep sort of and, and drum and bass scene um he doesn't really use compressors on his snares and he's quite public about that and yet his snares sound huge and, and you know dubstep the the snare is the focus of the track um and i think it's always an interesting point because you, you you look at other artists in let's say the dubstep scene and obviously you know you, you can hear that everything has just been squashed to shit um it achieves what it achieves personally i prefer a, a cleaner sound and and for me I would rather hear, uh, if you want the snare drum to be the main focus of your track, I would rather hear the snare drum just be a couple of dB above everything else in the mix and keep it clean. Um, and so long as you select the right sound in the first place, then it's going to have the impression of being much louder anyway. So um, in terms of compression, you know, loads of people I see have all sorts of buses and and auxiliary tracks and group tracks and whatever for for the drums for example and they throw in the kicks and the hats and the percussion and everything into this one big group and then compress it 
Now that's fine, it, it glues things together to an extent and it catches the peaks and that's not a major issue, especially if you're dealing with maybe real recording acoustic drums where you know one one hit of a, a hi-hat or a cymbal or whatever is going to be louder than another and you're, you, you're going to want to sort of manage those peaks. In electronic music, I really don't feel that there's much need for that. You're not going to have someone slip on a drum machine and, and hit the clap louder than it was recorded anyway it's not it's not really how it works however one thing you need to know about compression is it's not about it's not just about bringing levels down and maintaining and managing peaks it's about perceived dynamics of a sound so by bringing the difference between the loudest parts and the quietest parts to a narrower range, you're giving the impression of the quieter parts becoming louder because it's it's bringing the, the perceived loudness of the overall instrument up a level. So by bringing all the peaks down, you've got some room to push the gain up and bring everything else up with it. So bearing that in mind, I've written comp question mark here on this synth. So I'm just gonna solo that so I can find it over here. Right, so it runs pretty much throughout the track. Uh, this is, I think, the sound that came in over around here and I love the sound. Yeah, that's the one. So, that sound, I, you know, I've, I've probably mentioned it in both parts. When that's come in, I've sort of got a bit excited and it's because that sound just subtly kind of is there amongst the track and subjectively that makes me want more. Now you've got to be careful with sounds like that because if you have a particular sound that maybe becomes a key feature of the track but and makes people want more you've got to be careful not to give them too much because it can quickly get very boring. So what I'm going to do here is there are parts of this track that are particularly loud like over here and that's because the filters are open and then over here the filters are, are not closed but but less open so it's a lot more subtle and then there are other parts over here I think it's kind of in between oh and it's changed tempo as well so it's doing a lot. It's it's actually carrying the track throughout. There's obviously a lot of variations going on. There's another one over here I can see. There we go, and that's being high passed. So you know that that synth on its own carries the the track. It carries the the interest of the track. So it's something that I feel I want to feature more in the track. So if I go back here and play a bit. See, it's not a huge feature there if I solo what you were just listening to. It was there. But it's almost swamped under the other synths. But bearing in mind there are louder elements later on. So this is, I think, a good example of where I personally would start to go, right, well, this is where I'm going to need a compressor. In the last session, you'll have seen me use a transient master or a transient shaper which is very similar to a compressor but it just focuses on lifting or lowering the peaks for example so using the attack um, you're, you're getting that short snappy sound and you can raise how short and snappy or how, how much transient there is in that sound or you can do the same for the sustain which is kind of uh, almost a reactive compressor, I suppose, in terms of perceived loudness. You're raising the gains of, of micro dynamics of a sound, uh, whereas with a compressor, you're more averaging the, the macro dynamics, I suppose. So I tend to prefer, if I'm dealing, let's say, for example, I wanted a hi-hat to just be m much sharper, then for me, using a compressor that may be pulls everything down but has a slow attack so it lets that peak through is one way of achieving it but in my head I find it easier to just use a transient shaper and just push that attack higher. 
So with this synth, we're going for a much longer range of time. <coughs> with a hi-hat, you're looking at, you know, 50 milliseconds or whatever the length is. Um, whereas with this, we're looking over a much longer period of seconds or minutes. Um, so let's have a look. Uh, dynamics and we're going to go to compressors now a lot of people will sort of go oh what's your favorite compressor well I don't really have a favorite compressor it's only every now and then I load one up where I go yeah that doesn't work that, that didn't do what I want it to do um, and actually I'm kind of tempted to go with something like an L1 limiter rather than a compressor um, in fact let's go for the ultra mac maximizer here so, as per usual, with any sort of limiter compressor, you, you've got essentially the same controls on everything. Uh, I'll solo that and just play it so it's all just dry at the moment. So with that, you can see the the what is essentially the input signal and the output signal. They're reaching exactly the same levels, so that's fine. So if we start to bring down the threshold of this, and you should see the output change. So that's immediately bringing the output up, and then let's say we bring the output ceiling down as well. So what we can do is link these, in fact, let's do that. So bring them both up, link them. Oh, 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 I see, I'm using the wrong control. Right, so link and down, there we go. So if I start doing that, what you're doing is you're bringing down the, the maximum gain it's gonna let out and not only that, bringing down the threshold at what point it starts to raise the output, I suppose. Um, so we'll bring that down as we play. So there, we're still not getting any effect because the threshold you're bringing down and the output ceiling is at an equal level, which is what we want so far. Now, we can see here that the levels are peaking at minus 18, so it's only, I'm guessing, at that point that we're going to start hearing any effect. Um, however, I'm going to have to be very careful here because I know later on, or earlier on in fact, in the track, the peaks are a lot higher, so we're going to have to listen to that as well. Let's have a look. I keep doing that, sorry. Zero that off again. I keep thinking the link button is, is actually a button and not a slider. So let's bring it down to say 18. So you can hear I'm, I'm doing it excessively now, but minus 23 and you can see it's attenuating by, well, nearly 6 dB there. And I mean, this is a quiet part of the track as well. So if I go over here, it's going to be loud. So headphone wearing warning. Now, to me, that sounds squashed to shit. So it's not not great. But let's have a look. And I'll just play with this while I play. So even though that's peaking at minus 15 dB, I'm bringing the threshold down to say minus 20-ish, and I'm losing probably three or four dB of gain reduction. Doesn't sound squashed to shit. And then when we play the later part,
so it's still catching you know another say 2 dB so what that's doing is basically catching the upper 2 to 5 dB of sound and just holding it at a level so it's allowing us to now raise the level of that synth by a couple of dB and the perceived loudness of that synth overall will be a few dB but without peaking too heavily so that's uh, I hope I've explained that okay but that's probably the best I can explain it to be honest so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back a tiny bit and just listen to a few bars or so while that synth comes in here and there and I just want to check that I, I can now hopefully raise that by a few more dB on the mixer and hopefully that will have some sort of effect. So I've raised that a few more dB, let's go back again. Am I on the right one there? No, sorry, I've just... Uh... Yeah, no, I was on the right one, yeah. So that's sounding nice and I'm going to go back to this intro part as well and just double check it's not screaming out over everything else. So we're listening for this. Yeah, see now for me that's that's just really sort of brought the perceived loudness of that synth up to match the other main chords in there, but without over peaking and, and over compensating itself. So, and hopefully the same will have happened in this breakdown where it doubles up in tempo, I think. <laughs> And then again at the the drop. That's lovely. Um, just double check it was that. Yeah, it was that. And now. Let's just double check the difference there. So if I bypass that and then reset that. Yeah, it had a much nicer perceived loudness for me, um, which is a good thing. Uh, now there was, I think I might've written this. I've written reverb here and I'm not sure if it was that track. Let's have a listen. Yeah, it is that. So what I thought when I was listening to this just before I started recording the video was at these moments where the kicks come in and those hats are on their own, um, I felt like it was just a little dry. Yeah, I feel like that's just a touch dry. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick on some reverb. Um, again, I'm not going to recommend any particular reverb, but I, I know that what I'm after right now, I know there's uh, this plugin is pretty good for it's Dverb. Um, I don't even know who it's by, to be honest. I've, I've not used it many times. But what I do know 
is that sometimes on a hi-hat if you get the settings right it comes out great so just bypass it and hear them on their own so that's what we're dealing with if I just leave it as default here now obviously that's a huge amount of reverb um, so the first thing I'm going to do is bring the decay down um, it's probably going to be down to you know three four hundred milliseconds I would imagine but let's just have a listen yeah 500 milliseconds I think is more than enough for me for a for a hi-hat it really doesn't need to be long at all um, the gain for some reason on this thing defaults at minus four so we'll just knock that bad up, back up and the wet defaults to 100% so we'll just play with that now as well um, obviously we're not going to want it 100% we're just listening to the effect of it at the moment so <clears throat> I'll just give it another play and, and bring that dry wet level down but it'll probably only be you know maybe 15 20 percent by the end yeah i think that's probably about right i might even shorten it a bit more as well And make that a medium instead of large. Let's see what that does. Yeah, there we go. So it's just shortened the decay even more. So we're down to 336 milliseconds. It's it's pretty much nothing. And 18% dry wet on this particular reverb is uh, not very much at all. But I think that's just giving it a little bit more depth. So let's just see how it sounds. Yeah, I'm liking that. That's sounding pretty tight now. Um, so we're up to, uh, I don't know, about half an hour or so now. Um, so I'm going to leave it there, I think. Um, right, I think that is basically, uh, in terms of individual instruments and what needs doing to those things, I think that's pretty much it in terms of uh, the overall mix down now so in the next session I'm going to be looking at two fundamental things which kind of merge into one um, essentially now we've got any tricky sounds or any things that annoy me kind of leveled out we've lifted a couple of synths here and there we've lifted a few hats we've scooped out bits and pieces we've kind of basically made the track sound a lot cleaner anything that needs to poke out now pokes out and that's kind of your your first major stage done in your mix down your next step for me is now listening to the track as a whole and finding the right balance of um generally in the low end is there enough or too much generally in the high end is there enough or too much generally does everything swing to the left hand speaker or the right or whatever you know you're listening to the stereo balance and the overall amplitude and the overall frequency response and ranges and that kind of ties into uh although as a mix down i would never recommend you um that you master it as well but I know a lot of people tend to master their own stuff these days I sometimes master my own stuff especially if I've got a gig coming up and I just want to play it out in a club um, so I, I kind of have my own little chain that I set up so the next video will be just kind of covering uh, the overall feeling in in terms of objective feeling of a track and where it sits uh, getting that balance right ready for the master stage um, but hopefully if we've got enough time in that video I'll also just go through a quick sort of rough what I do for the master stage um, and I think that is pretty much it for part three so 
hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, please do like, comment, subscribe, get involved with the YouTube channel. The more people that share the video, the more likely I'm going to do more of these videos. Um, yeah, otherwise, I'll see you soon. Cheers.